This is The Unholy Union. A podcast where you'll be subjected to highly offensive marital discourse. If you do not feel insulted during this week's episode, don't worry, we'll try harder next week. If you can relate to our ramblings, we want to be friends with you. If you believe that we take it too far or our mouths are too much for you, then with as much love and sincerity as we can muster, you can suck it. Welcome to The Unholy Union. All right, last week's episode was all about me (laughs) and my OCD struggles. And I wanted to do this week to to lend it more towards the support system side. So, Linz, I wanted you to kind of go through what you went through when I had OCD and I went to the hospital, blah, 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 blah. Listen to last week's episode if you have not, because this is part two. (laughs) But... You lived it firsthand of being the support system for someone who was extremely sick in my brain. (laughs) My brain was broken. You helped me along with other people, but you were there every single day and you helped me through it. I mean, without you, my parents, your parents, everybody, there's no way I would have made it out of there. So what... What advice could you give to people that have a loved one that is going through something similar, be it depression, anxiety, OCD, whatever it is? I mean, mental illness is mental illness. So, yeah, still in the mental health awareness month here. So I definitely think it's important to talk about my advice on a more general level is we talked last week about the person who is seeking the help and support right. being their own advocate. Well, I think the supporter should also be boots on the ground as well. Yep. So if I'm just going to use us, <laughs> yeah. but when we started talking about trying to find someone who was more of a specialist, I supported you through that. I tried to help you find people. I tried to do the research with you so in tandem, right? Yeah, exactly. Whatever you thought you needed, I was trying to help you through that. So being boots on the ground with the person going through it. But even more specific to OCD, I knew that I, I've known you since we were teenagers, right? Yep. So I knew that this moment in time was not you. Like this is not the person I've known my whole life. Right. This is a mental health issue and we were going to overcome it and get over it. So for me, I think it's important for people to realize it's a moment in time. Right. Yeah. I like that. Specifically with OCD, right? Well, I mean, everything. Well, yeah. Because if, if you have a support system and you go seek proper treatment, all that stuff can be worked through. Right. All mental illness. It, it, Yes, it you will be considered in recovery right. and technically it never goes away, but I believe that you can live a fulfilling and happy life. The moment that we got to though with you going to the hospital, like those are the the deep dark scary moments and that's not going to be the rest of your life. Exactly. Hopefully. Hopefully, for most people, I don't think it should be like if you seek support and help and you're getting treatment like that should not that will not be the rest of your life. Exactly. If you do it, if you do the right thing and you be your own advocate and have the support system behind you, as in like like what you were for me, you'll get you you can you, you can get better. Right. So I think for someone who has a mental illness. I mean, to me, OCD is a big one. It, some of the categories that it could be in are kind of scary. A hundred percent. It scared the shit out of me. (laughs) Right. And I mean, it scared me too. Um, But knowing that that is not the person who I fell in love with, that I grew up with, that I'm in a relationship with, that we were going to come out on the other side of this. Right. And this is just a moment in time. It's deep, dark, and scary, but it's going to pass. We will get over this. So kind of twofold there. Yeah. My advice. (laughs) See, and and exactly, like, I I like you saying that it's just a moment in time because I think a lot, what happened to me, it it would scare a lot of people. Yeah. It was, I, I, well, 
if you're not insane, <laughs> it would it would scare everybody. But that's the thing. Like people would say that you know people with mental health are insane, but no. they're not. No, it's a moment in time, and they need help. There are bad people. Don't get true. me wrong. Very true. But if you have been with someone, or they're your son, your daughter, you've lived with them for. I mean, when, when did this happen? When I was 30? I don't know. No, 32? <laughs> I'm trying to do the I math. Can't, I can't. So, <laughs> <laughs> 31. Yeah. I think it was 31. Okay. Anyways, early 30s. So I've known you at that point 15 years. Right. And you knew that that wasn't me. So you didn't you you didn't feel like I was a, a bad person. No. Because you knew I wasn't. Right. You knew I wasn't. <laughs> yeah, is that right? You knew that I am not. You knew that I... I was not. Yeah, maybe. I wasn't. That's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> but anyway, that is kind of advice that I think everybody should take. That just because your loved one might feel a certain way or is thinking weird shit or is depressed, that just know that's not them. Right. It's like they have the flu. Give them medicine to get better. Well, give them support to get better. Yep. Don't treat them like they're the plague. Right. Like they're diseased because it, exactly. it's not. It's, it's, not. <laughs> it's a moment in time. You find the right pathway to toward recovery exactly and the person that was may be a little different i mean there's you know it's a, it's a life-changing experience oh yeah but hopefully you come out stronger on the other side and truthfully i believe that i have i, I believe that i'm not like i used to be very not i wouldn't say introverted but kind of with strangers like i wouldn't talk i wouldn't really want to talk to people and things like that but now it's more like kind of outgoing. I'm not as nervous when I speak in front of people. Everything made me nervous. <laughs> Anxiety. <laughs> Everything. And then it evolved into OCD. But it's important, though, that you don't treat your loved one or whoever that you know with any type of weirdness. Don't, don't act like they're weird. J treat them like they, you know, like you always have, but take it a step further and support them through it all because they need it. Absolutely. Just because they have doctors and teams of, you know, psychologists and psychiatrists behind them, that that's not enough. That's they're not that's not family, that's not close friends. They still need someone that is in their corner at home that loves them. That loves them and will love them and they know that. Yep. Because I kept kicking because of you and our kid. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that right there, I would get into dark places and then I would pull myself out of it by using you two mm -hmm. <laughs> as fuel to get better. Right. ERP, exposure res response prevention therapy, fucking sucks. Yeah. It is awful. Yep. It's one of the hardest things you'll ever do if you have OCD, but I am a testament to it working and I have come out better. And when I do get, you know, like I said earlier, it it's a lifelong thing. But if I do get kind of like a sticky thought that stays up in there, I know what to do with it now. Right. Which is nothing. Well, <laughs> and I think as, you know, Someone who went with it, went through it with you. I went to some of, well, I tried to go to all of the first appointments. Right. Not only as the support person, like to be there with you, but also to learn. Like yeah. how, how are you receiving help from these people? So how can I in turn reinforce that at home? Right. So for me, going with you to some of these appointments and learning from them, you know, the things that they're talking to you about, things that they're telling you to do. For me, I bring that home and, and then I'm the reinforcement at home when you're not in front of the therapist or right. the psychologist. Exactly. So I felt that was important too. And the last thing I'll say about advice is... I looked up some statistics and caregivers are a little different than, you know, just a support system. But on average, caregivers who have depression are about 40 to 70 percent 
They report that they have symptoms of depression while being a caregiver to someone with any any sort of disability from the mental health range all the way through physical. Oh, okay. So this is like, I, I, I didn't know what you meant by caregiver, like your, your kid? No, no, no. Okay, um, okay. Like someone who is disabled Ill. or ill, someone from the mental health all the way to physical. They report having symptoms of depression, about 40 to 70% of them. Well, on top of that, about... 25.7% of those caregivers have suicidal risk and or ideation. I can see that. I was, I'm not going to lie. I was genuine, genuinely worried about you because. Why are you worried about me <laughs> well, when you're the one going through it? Because it, of how I felt. I was like, man, I hope like this doesn't affect you in a way because of how easy I was triggered into OCD. I was, I mean, I feel like everybody can just randomly get triggered. And it's true. They can. Mm -hmm. It's not likely. It's, it's, OCD is not common. No, true. It, it is not common. But the fact that I was able to be triggered in a way that put me in the fucking hospital, I was concerned that that was going to happen to you or my parents because we were kind of, Staying with them to help support me because it was come and go yep. <laughs> at, at, at points. It was scary. So I, I wanted to be around people as much as I could. And that's the, that's another set of advice that I would like to give well, someone. Can go I ahead. finish yeah, my yeah, advice? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so of those people who have um, depression and or those thoughts, ideation of suicide, A, don't do it. But on top of that, Caregivers or anyone in a support system role who feels like they have to take on extra or be more involved in something that may seem scary or dark or take care of yourself, too. A hundred percent. There came a point, I think, you were on medication and the psychologist and we were at a really good point. Like you, I think we talked about the summer you were at, I forget, with 75 or 90, we said, um, yeah. percent better. So about that time. I was like, okay, let me focus on me. And I probably could have done it sooner. Don't at me. But <laughs> um, I took it upon myself to go to therapy for me. Exactly. And not that I needed a psychologist and think that I, you know, had a mental health disorder that needed to be diagnosed. I just needed to talk to somebody who wasn't in directly involved and just essentially vent, right? Well, and they peel their... Talk therapists are there and they're able to peel back the onion right. more, more better <laughs> than if you were to talk to me. Right. Obviously, they are trained in this and they're good at what they do. Most of them. Yeah. Most of them. If they are attacking a thing that they're supposed to be attacking, like what you had, you like you said, you needed to vent. You needed talk therapy. Right. That's what that is. Right. But for me, that that was complete opposite of what I needed. So, yeah, I would say to anyone, support role, caregiver, whatever you are doing, it is important to, to take care of yourself at some point. I mean, there's no right or wrong time, but when you feel like there is an opportunity for you to do something for yourself and get some relief, even if it is talk therapy or if it's just taking a day for yourself, like yes. have your own support system to be able to do that. So I think it's important for people not to forget themselves in the process. Right. So again, I, I went to talk therapy, talked it out, spent a couple weeks with a therapist and felt lighter for it. And we were able to finish our journey. And here we are today. Exactly. And another thing that you did well with me was I had a harm OCD. We spoke about that before. Scary thoughts about hurting people. Well, and yourself. <laughs> yeah. And myself. And... You, when we went to the hospital, they treated me like a monster. Mm -hmm. You never did that. No one in in the family did that. Right. They didn't reinforce that in my brain, that that was the right thing my brain was saying to me. Right. You know? We weren't afraid of you. Exactly. You weren't treating me any different. You weren't like, you can't stay around our daughter and da 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 It was essentially try to live normally. But while dealing with this mental illness. Yep. While learning how to deal with it. Exactly. 
but it helped because I was like, okay, I mean, this is going, this is rumination, but in my head, when I was going through all that shit, I was like, all right, she trusts me, (laughs) you know, she's not afraid of me or of me being around our kid and things like that. So I must be okay. Yep. Now that at the point, at that point was not the right thing to do in my head because that's reinforcement to those thoughts being negative, but it still was helpful when I didn't know that I had OCD. Right. Like before all of that, all of the diagnosis and all that stuff, and I wasn't sure what I had, that helped me big time with not feeling like a fucking bad person. Well, and I think that goes back to what we said at the beginning, right? This is a moment in time. Yes. It is a moment in time if you are on the path trying to find your diagnosis, trying to find your treatment, it will end. This is For not sure. a forever thing. Right. I mean, forever in the sense that you're going to be in this deep dark hole forever. Yep. Th- that's impossible. You have to find a way out of it. That's that's human will, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> human you... will mm-hmm. is to be almost desperate if you're stuck in a hole. You're going to try and get out. Um it's like so a an animal backed into a corner right it's an instinct you are going to fight so that moment in time however long it feels is gonna end because if you fight for yourself be your advocate you're gonna come out on the other side Um, so for me and your family we know you we know that there's gonna be an end that there was gonna be an other side to this so did you say me and your family well i'm (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Come on now. What is Our, happening? <laughs> I've added a Y. Did you forget that we're married? Well, I was trying to say your parents, and I think I said, and, but I meant wanted to include my, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> so, so your parents are my family, but they're not yours? I'm very confused. It's late. <laughs> <laughs> we said we were going to do this in the morning, so uh, we're sharper. Uh, Here yeah, we are. It's, it's 10 o'clock. And, yeah. Okay. But we're old. Yeah, I know. Ten o'clock and we're old. So, I mean, I guess that's the majority of the advice that I think you could provide, right? Or is there anything you'd like to add? Hmm. No. Okay. Well, I wanted to to segue from from your advice to some funny stories that I had in the hospital. Oh, God. Okay. While I was there, there was some weird shit going on because, as stated previously... They lump you in, no matter what you have, with a lot of different people with a lot of different mental illness. Now, some of this stuff, could they could be violent. Uh, That was a story that I have where the dude essentially cussed out the security officer and was very threatening to the security officer, blah, blah, blah. That's not a funny part. But the funniest moment in there, a nurse, so they do rounds, Right. All day long. I think it's every 15 minutes. There's They have their little cart with the laptop on it, and they're checking to make sure everybody's accounted for, you know. Giving medicine if needed. Giving medicine if needed, all that stuff. Well, nurse comes around, pushing her cart. She looks into one of the rooms, and she notices this is not safe for work, 100%. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Is this during the day or at night? This was during the day. Okay. Which is fucking weird, too. But <laughs> so all the doors are open. Everybody's wandering everybody, around. Yes. Well, nurse walks in, checks on everybody. They, she sees a guy, and he's jerking off. She said, hey. I mean, she was nice. She said, hey, man, you gotta, you can't do that because you're... I mean, all these rooms have two people in them, at least. Right. Every single room has at least two people in them because it's not a big facility. And he goes off. And starts yelling and screaming. I couldn't really understand what she was saying or what he was saying. And he was steaming mad Mm -hmm. all day long. Well, Well, he didn't have an orgasm. I'd be mad, too. He he got blue balled by the nurse. (laughs) Uh, Well, then we had lunch. So this was in the morning between breakfast and lunch. Well, we had lunch. We went in there. And he's mouthing off, you know, saying random ass shit to the nurse staff and all that. Well... He finally saw the actual nurse that cussed him out, or not cussed him out, but told him to cut it out. And he said, I don't know why you stopped me from masturbating, 
It is not against my religion. <laughs> I was like, bro, I don't think that's the point of it. <laughs> I don't think any religion really has <laughs> masturbation laws in it, does it? But, but I don't think that's why. I don't think she stopped you because of you being anti-religious. <laughs> I think she was stopping you because, first off, she didn't want to see it. Mm-hmm. She then, didn't want to have to clean it up. She didn't want to have to clean it up. And then the dude laying in the bed next to you doesn't want to see that either. <laughs> That's vile. Well, I wonder what this person's affliction was. I don't know. He, I think he... Nymphomaniac? No, I think he was... Um, <laughs> you say no so casually, like, nah, I can be a sex addict. No. I mean, I guess he could have been, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure he was a, a schizophrenic. Aw. Yeah. I think he had schizophrenia. He... This was not his first time in the facility, as far as I could hear. I kept, uh, you know, hearing overhearing him talking and saying that I was like this third or fourth time, and blah 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 blah. It was, it was wild. There were some characters in there, and I've got I've got a lot of stories <laughs> about that place. And well, it was interesting because whenever. <laughs> It sounds like jail again, right? They allowed visiting hours. Yes. Um, so I was there every day. And during those visiting hours, we would talk and, you know, just kind of hang out for an hour and a half or whatever. Yeah, as, and as long as they let you stay. Right. We'd talk about our kid and what's going on and try again to bring that normalcy into life. But it was interesting. You did look around a lot. Like you were like constantly looking around what was going on who's saying what well i had extreme anxiety at that time <laughs> i know <laughs> I was like, uh, everything was closing in on me but it just seemed like you were like it was like the drama of the building you well, were like all it was it monitoring. was bad it, it was really bad i it was hard especially when you have ocd and you don't know it yet like i would hear things that people were saying Hey, have you heard voices today? The nurse would say to someone. And then that spun me up right. to think that I was then hearing voices because that's what OCD does. Yeah. It makes you question everything. Everything. And it usually focuses on like one thing at a time. So harm OCD and then it'll morph into, you know, health OCD. Right. Am I schizophrenic or am I hearing voices? And then I stayed up all night and I didn't get any sleep. Yeah, we used to call you a hypochondriac. Yeah, and I, it definitely was that. Mm -hmm. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Every no. now and then. Uh, that no. big, we kidding. saw a gopher tortoise today, and I licked him because I was... You did not <laughs> lick it. <laughs> no, no it was a, that was a test to see if I was still uh, still having contamination OCD. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't lick the tortoise. I wanted to, you, though. You touched it. I did but, touch him. And then you used hand sanitizer because salmonella. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure I got salmonella before from our um, one of our class tortoises that we had. Okay, we are like way off the rails <laughs> right now. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Bring it back. Do you have any other stories? Um, there was one guy, we were doing some kind of exercise in the, we they do group therapy, which is talk therapy. Once again, not effective for me, but I did it anyway. And it was like an exercise of write three words, starting with the letter S or something like, or three activities that you like to do. And then we went down the ABCs. I guess it was just to kind of pull you out of your brain, you yeah. know, like give you something to focus on, give you something that's not depression, anxiety, OCD, addiction to focus on. Well, I don't know. A, alcohol. I mean, well, B, blunt. I mean, it, all that <laughs> shit starts with a letter. Duh. <laughs> well, it's just me and like, someone with an addiction, I don't know if that's going to work. But Well, so it wasn't like you had to do every letter. They went around the room. So oh, everybody picked, everybody picked one letter. Well, it didn't pick. It was just random. So. You went first. You got letter A. Oh. Well, this guy got called, right? And then she said, what's your favorite activity? And it with, starts with letter S. And he sex. said, sex. <laughs> and this dude was a giant, big, heavy set guy. I laughed my fucking ass off. I had to leave. I'm like, well, this group therapy's ruined for me. <laughs> <laughs> a little highlight for the day. Yeah, I laughed so damn hard. And it... Oh my gosh, it was it was hilarious. I mean, I met people there also that are now lifelong friends. Mm -hmm. And it, 
it did change me. I mean, I, I talked a lot of negative about it on our last episode just because of how certain people are treated in there. But no, I don't think we talked negative about it. I think the system is not set up for people to be successful in their mental health journey. No, I agree. So I don't think that's negative. That's fact. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, it, yeah, but it's not a good fact. It's just It doesn't matter if it's good or bad. It's it's just the truth. It's just strange to me though how they have doctors for every part of your body. You have a freaking podiatrist for your feet. Well, they even have brain surgeons yeah. and You have an ENT for, you know, ear, nose and throat. But it's like, oh, you have a mental illness? Well, here, go to this one person. Well, it's like there's the, no specialty. What what do you call that? So you have like the brain surgeon who knows all of the places in your brain. Right. Knows like the frontal lobe, like can tell you what each piece of your brain is and can do surgery for certain things. But when it comes to like thoughts, they know which nothing. are right, which are what do you want to say? Imaginary. <laughs> like this is thoughts aren't things that you can even attribute to a single place in the brain. Nope. So for something like that, that is so intangible, I guess. Exactly. It's like no person can be specialized in that is what it seems, what it feels like when you're on this journey. Right. But your brain, your, your brain, your brain, it, the, my first therapist said it best. He said your brain is plastic because it's, it, it's moldable. It changes. Plastic? I think that's what he said. Maybe Clay? No, he said your brain is plastic, as in it's it changes over time. I think that's a term for like changeable, moldable type deal. I don't oh, like it. But I don't, okay, I don't like. Well, that's what he said. Okay, <laughs> it, it stuck clay. with it, it, I feel clay. Okay, is better. okay. Well, anyway, it stuck with me because that kind of gave me more fuel to move through this too. Because he was like, your brain changes all the time, and it's true. There's a video out there, go YouTube it, of brain cells trying to communicate to each other. It is fucking insane. And that's something, I guess, tangible that can be seen, but... It doesn't matter. You, they, they, can't, they can't say, oh, if you think this, it communicates this way. No, right, it doesn't. These brain cells are going to meet. Nope. That, no, you don't know what those brain cells are doing. Hell no. But it, you could see it. It... This one single brain cell was reaching, and it looks like electricity. Mm-hmm. And trying it, to make the neural pathway. Yeah, yeah, trying to make the neural pathways and, and trying to go touch another brain cell. It, I was like, holy shit. Mm -hmm. So that was my problem. I was lighting up the wrong neural pathways, and right. I was reinforcing the wrong neural pathways. So it was easy for those brain cells to communicate back and forth. Well, I trained myself. To put a roadblock in between those neural pathways and try to make other ones. Yeah, the more positive ones, the ones that, quote unquote, are normal. <laughs> yeah, I don't, <laughs> still not normal. Right. Intrusive <laughs> thoughts all day. Did you say, did you just say right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things we didn't talk about when it was your turn, your session, was some of the things that we found for OCD, like help support there are actual, like we said, the rehab facilities for alcoholics. There was an actual place in Texas. There is. There is. I am not 100% sure what the, they changed their names, I believe. It was like OCD Center or something. Mm. But I believe they went through a name change. Yeah, this, again, this was back in 2019, 2020. Exactly. Uh, but. It, I can't remember what part of Texas, but if you do have OCD and you need help, they are a specialized place. You can actually stay there. And I believe they do, it's called the Bergen Method. Mm -hmm. It's it's nuts. So ERP usually takes, I can't remember, they say it takes roughly three to six months right. to, for, for you to learn and essentially... Build the a, neural pathways. Yeah, build your neural pathways and know how to do it so you don't have to keep going to therapy. The Bergen Method is like... I think it's five days. Mm -hmm. You get all this shit done. Yeah, it was like a week long that you would stay there. I couldn't believe it. And I, I was going to pay for it out of pocket. And it was like... Multi-thousands. It was tens of thousands, I yeah. thought. But truthfully... Would it, it have been worth it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, it's it's proven to work. And the fact that 
they can do it in five days. Just use that as hope too. You know, Absolutely. if you have OCD, try to, try to go there. Seriously. If you know, try to find that Bergen method or I don't know, f- just find an ERP therapist <laughs> because it, it's, it's insane how quick that you will feel relief. Yes. Three to six months sounds like a long time, but the alternative is, do you want to live with OCD raging OCD forever? Yeah. And that was just one of the things that we found though. Like, again, the idea of going down the research rabbit hole, the person who's trying to be their own advocate as well as the person supporting them. And I believe you were already seen a psychologist at that point, the first one who actually gave you the diagnosis. Yes. And at that time we were looking at this thing in Texas popped up, but we were also looking at the next psychologist but that was like our last ditch effort. We said, we're going to do this. If oh, yeah. we absolutely have, we'll figure it out. I have no idea what we're going to do, but your recovery meant that much. Oh yeah. Like, it meant that much. See, and that's another, another piece of advice for your, for, for people that are the support system. You know, if they need help, I know times are tough and, and shit like that, but try to make an effort to pay no, no, no amount of money is worth their suffering like that. It's, I mean, no amount of money is too, too great, too great for to, that kind of suffering. Exactly. I mean, you, you go and you pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for a physical ailment that like a brain surgeon to work on your brain, but treat this the same way. Yep. It's, it's still something wrong and it's still treatable and you can move on from it, but it, <laughs> unfortunately it costs a fuck ton of money. Yeah. But again, why does the system not work to help individuals who are going through this right. with something that's proven to work? Exactly. I could not find a single ERP therapist that would take insurance. Psychologist. ERP psychologist. Well, ERP therapist. They're, they're still technically therapists, but I could not find one that would take our insurance. Nowhere to be found. I'm going to fight you on this. It's psychologists. Psychologists are therapists. No, I don't think so. Yes. I think therapists don't have doctorates. It, it's. <laughs> Thank you. We had a teacher in high school that was called a doctor. Yeah, but that was like a doctor of English or history. I can't remember what it she It doesn't taught. matter. She wanted you to call her that, doctor, whatever. Right. She earned a doctorate in whatever she was teaching. I'm not calling you a doctor if you teach English. We're off the rails again. <laughs> I'm not calling you a doctor if you teach English class. But my point is (laughs) psychologists actually get doctorate degrees in brain psychology. I know. Therapists can have anything from a certificate to a master's degree. I don't think they have a doctorate. I don't know. I still think they're considered therapists. I'm going to fight you on this. What When they apply ERP therapy to me, what is that person called? A psychologist. What the? F- Something just jumped onto the window. Don't open it. I don't want to. <laughs> we might need to end this quick. <laughs> no. Yeah. Do you have any closing remarks? So I guess maybe just recap, right? Be supportive. Love well, them like they are normal, you know, well, and yeah. not not going through any shit. Who love who you know? The person that yes. you know is there. They're just going through a hard time. Exactly. And treat them like the I person, mean, you know, obviously don't treat them like everything's normal because it's not. But if they ask you for help, if it's a weird ass request, like, hey, come sit with me for a half hour. You don't know what's going through their head. Yep. They might be at the at the very last, you know, moment that they feel, you know, I don't know, like, like they might be hopeless. Go give them hope. They're not a drag on you. They're not meaning to do this. It's Yes, it might be a pain in the ass, but it's not their fault. It right. really isn't. Their brain is broken, and they need you to help them fix it. Also remember to take, to take, to <laughs> take care of yourself. Exactly. Take care of yourself. Don't, don't feel like you have to take all the weight from this onto your shoulders well, and even if you do, you need to find moments to relieve yourself of it. Exactly. But just know that they're going through some shit that they can't explain either. 
And it is a moment in time. It's a moment in time, and it will be over soon. Yep. Also remember that there is help out there. You can find it. Be your own self-advocate. Go searching. But there is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline if you want to call 988 or text 988 to get in touch with somebody if you need help now. And like we said last time, email us. Yep, exactly. If you need support, email us. Let us know. Not- we- <laughs> We may be virtual, little talking heads to you, but we can, at the very least, give you support. Point you to the right direction. I mean, I feel like a pro at, seriously, researching weird stuff that go that went on in my head. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I know how, how to think, do the uh, keywords. Chat GPT would do with that. Ooh, I wish I would have had that back then. I wonder what it would do. A lot of people are replacing their search engines with Chat GPT. Really? Yep. Because it's it pulls everything from everywhere. Huh. But uh, there was one thing, uh, one other thing that I wanted to say about all this, and it was, you might feel hopeless, but it's it's not hopeless. You're loved, and it's not worth doing something that you can't take back. Yep, it will end. It yep. This too shall pass. Mm-hmm. What is that from? I don't know. I feel like it's Shakespeare. <laughs> But the point is, is it's temporary. Pain is temporary. Be strong. Fight through it. Do what you got to do. Ask your friends. Ask your parents. Ask your loved ones. Whoever it is, ask for help when you need it. Ask us. We're here. We'll always be here. Love you. Bye. It's what you do with the things you love.